JJ and the Little Magpie. How I Became Pen Pals with Someone on Death Row. Hello, Miss Valerie. My story is too long to put in the comments, so I wrote you a letter. I'm 29 years old now and the first in my family to go to university. My mother was always a housewife. My father was the breadwinner. My brother and I were raised with conservative values. To put it short and clear, my father had control over us. He especially kept my mother on a short leash. It has always been a toxic relationship. I recognized it in my teens, but my mom refused to change things for her and her children. Even though she was thinking about leaving him, she never found the strength to do it. Things changed when my brother and I became adults, both of us out of the house and on our own. One day, my mom felt open enough to tell me that she had an affair with a man she really fell in love with, and he was quite opposite to my father. She wanted a divorce, but the first time she wanted to break up, my father tried to commit suicide. We almost lost him. That was when I was about seven years old. I barely remember. He promised to change radically, but my mom was already through with it. And I have to add on that point, he didn't change at all. His narcissistic behavior would always come through, always with intention to hurt and keep control over the life he's built up. Everybody knew that his ego was unstable, but he moved into his own apartment and it happened. What we all expected would happen. He committed suicide. He was dead in his bed for about five days, exactly five days before his 55th birthday. As a daughter who was forced to function next to an almost handicapped brother, the normal child, the pride of the family, a thread in my mind ripped apart. I was not enough of a reason to keep my father from committing suicide. Six months of numbness and overthinking the family situation, ending with my father's death. I was lost. I was somewhere between anger and grief. So I did what I always do. I changed things. I quit my job. I told a not so great friend a short goodbye. I got a job as a social worker with troubled teens, away from the desk and coworkers who judge every single step I make and so on. I've always been interested in documentaries about people who become pen pals with a person on death row. I know that there are women who look specifically for relationships with a man in these situations, but for me, that actually wasn't the case. I was interested in proving that these people are human beings. I was interested in their feelings, their reasons about why they did their crimes, and how they feel about them today. I just love reading people. It's not only my job, it's my nature. Potentials and resources are everywhere, but people on death row might have been forgotten. Forgotten about themselves, probably, too. Why I wrote a man on death row wasn't pity. It was true interest and the hope to find a friend. I missed the feeling of being appreciated, and my pen pal would miss that, too, so why not help each other out? I found a man whose announcement on a specific German homepage for finding pen pals on death row interested me. I was ignoring the announcements from men who were looking for a romantic relationship, and also those with many typos and bad grammar. I was looking for a polite person with whom I could share things on the same intellectual basis with. I didn't care about gender or race either. I wrote my letter, and about a month later, there was a letter from JJ in my mailbox. I was freaked out. The announcement had already been a few years old. What if that man was already executed? JJ was polite, very interested, and open-minded. So I answered his letter, and he answered back. And we answered each other every single time. We became friends. We came to a point where we began to text each other via a special app for incarcerated people. I've sent him pictures of me, my home, my daily life, and he wanted to call. Lord, I'm a German girl from a small town. I wouldn't understand anything he's talking about, and that's going to be hella embarrassing for both of us. But I was too curious that I got myself an American phone number. And he called. Had a very hard time understanding everything at first, but it got a lot better in a short time. I kind of speak English fluently today. Weeks after calling almost daily, I was looking forward to our talks every time. We never ran out of subjects to talk about. And gosh, he became flirty. I knew what was going on, but I let him be. He was happy about it, and I was happy too. He liked me in a way I never experienced before, unconditionally. It would still overwhelm me sometimes today. It was a sunny day in May when he said on the phone that he wanted to talk about something serious. My heart was pounding because I knew what was about to happen. He said, Em, I love you. I really do. I cried my eyes out. That warm feeling scared me because a relationship like that would be madness. And I actually really used that word right after his confession. I couldn't answer in the way he would have liked me to. And he never pushed me into it. He only wanted me to know that he loves me. That's it. And whatever will happen will happen.
We decided not to put this kind of relationship into a category, didn't define it in any way, just let it be. And a few days later, when he was talking about his past as a teen, I got an image of him in my head and I felt it. I loved him too. I already knew, but the image made it clear, so I told him. I think I just said it. I even interrupted the story he told. He was baffled, but happy. We had bad times in between, but we are still together. The circumstances of our relationship, of course, are hard. It's hard to explain why I can deal with it without physical contact, but I think the reason is what I already said. He appreciates me unconditionally, and I love him for being the most empathic and sensitive human being I've ever met. On death row, a man forgotten by society, but not by his little magpie, as he calls me. His pet name for me, Little Magpie, was made up after I told him that I raised a magpie chick a few years ago. When she was old enough to be on her own, I freed her. Today, I have a tattoo on my right leg with a head of a magpie and a Latin sentence on its side that says, nobody exists on purpose. Nobody on death row exists on purpose, but I'm sure many of them would use their existence for good if they could. JJ does. Thank you for reading, Miss Valerie. Greetings from Germany, The Little Magpie.